Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this, this afternoon for this contemporary military forum titled Integrated Deterrence Through Resilience, Whole of Government Response to Hazards and Threats. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army is proud to provide forums like this for all of us in our professional development. AUSA will amplify the U.S. Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and help to further the association's mission to be the voice of the Army and support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. We do this through your membership. If you're a member, we thank you for that membership. And if you're not, we encourage you to visit the AUSA member portal or our booth downstairs and join this great association. That is booth 307 in Exhibit Hall A. On behalf of General Brown, AUSA's president, and the rest of the AUS team, we have a small token for our speakers that will be here, a wonderful deck of cards that they can take and keep, by the way. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Major General Bob Weddle, the Deputy Commanding General of U.S. Army North, who will, address, who will introduce our panel and will lead this further. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Red. Well, sir, mine magically came on. We'll find out if yours does. But I'll hand you this one if it doesn't, so we're working through with the mics. Hey, it's really great to see everyone today, and we're, we're thrilled uh, with the turnout here. And uh, after the panel, I'm sure you'll tell everyone how incredible all this was, and, and they'll all wish they had been here with you. But thank you for the, for the great turnout. And uh, I'd like to just start by saying this is, we'd like to thank AUSA for this, uh, this opportunity to have a panel on Homeland Defense. And we're going we're gonna to begin. I'll introduce General Van Herc the NORTHCOM commander in a moment. He's gonna give some remarks. He's got 30 minutes with us, so the, the rest of the panel is, is uh, gonna join us after 30 minutes. But he'll give some opening remarks, probably uh, three to five minutes, and then I'll ask him a series of questions, and I, and I think you're, we're really gonna get a lot out of it. So General Van Herc, he's commanded at every level of the Air Force, of course. He was the, uh, the J-5 on the Joint Staff, which does all that interagency work, all the policy work uh, for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and then he was Director of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And now he is the Commander of U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD. And uh, it, obviously a, a large scope of responsibility. Sir, we're really thrilled that you've took, taken time out of your schedule to, to be with us today. Uh, you're the only combatant commander uh, that's gonna be here at the AUSA conference. Uh, really means a lot to to the Army to have you here. And with that, sir, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, we'll check. It's working. Great. Thanks. <laughs> well, thanks, Bob. I, I, don't time me on three to five minutes, okay? I, I appreciate that. Thanks, thanks for all that you do in the Army North team, uh, what you do for uh, the United States Northern Command. Is we defend our homeland and provide defense support of civil authorities. Really important. And theater security cooperation. Um, I have to thank uh, AUSA. I won't say everything again, but uh, for the opportunity to be here. I, I think the Army's got five combatant commanders, six, and I'm the only one. The Air Force guy shows up. It's hard, hard to believe. But uh, anyway, I'm not critiquing my fellow combatant commanders. Uh, it's great to be here. I, I have to thank uh, Secretary Warmoth and uh, Chief McConville. Uh, the Army has just knocked it out of the park when it comes to my role uh, as a commander of the United States Northern Command for the last almost 26 months. Uh, the Army steps up every time uh, we need support, whether that be uh, through COVID, whether that be through Allies Welcome, whether that be through hurricane response. I never get the, is that a valid requirement, a request. I just get what we need to accomplish the mission, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I would also thank the Army for embracing uh, the Arctic strategy that the Department put out. If you didn't notice, on Friday, the White House suddenly put out an Arctic strategy as well, and the number one pillar on that Arctic strategy is defense of the Arctic, and so look forward to that. And the Army's leading the way uh, with uh, what you're doing up in Alaska with the 11th Airborne uh, Corps as well and uh, the things that you provide us for our campaigning. So uh, thanks to the United States Army for supporting uh, United States Northern Command and uh, NORAD. I'm going to talk to you real quick about how I see the strategic environment from a homeland defense perspective. Uh, what we're doing to get after that, and then uh, I think Bob's going to uh, create some havoc by asking me some questions. So I really look forward to that. But uh, in my uh, nearly 36 years or so, uh, this is the most dynamic and challenging uh, time that we've seen, if you just look around and pay attention to the news. Um, for the first time in our nation's history, two strategic peers, both nuclear armed, 
uh, that we need to deal with. And we've got uh, a, a third out there actor that continues to shoot ballistic missiles and, uh, uh, you know, use the rhetoric, uh, the nuclear rhetoric as well, that continue to challenge us. Violent extremists haven't gone away. Transnational criminal organizations are a significant threat, creating significant challenges, uh, not only in the Western Hemisphere and on our border, but around the globe. Uh, I, I could keep uh, going on and on and on. Uh, the bottom line is, in the environment that we're in today, before we commit forces anymore into a conventional uh, fight, potentially, we ought to ask ourselves a couple of questions. The first question we should ask ourselves is, What's the risk of uh, an attack on our homeland? And then what's the risk of strategic deterrence failure? I would tell you that those questions haven't been asked for about three decades. They need to be asked before we find ourselves on an escalation ladder that we can't get off of. I would tell you that uh, you, you find yourself in some pretty, pretty tough decisions uh, that, that we have to make as a nation once you get on that uh, escalation ladder. And I think it's my job to have that discussion early with the President and with the Secretary of Defense before we jump on that ladder and understand what those uh, risks are. Our uh, competitors, those challengers, potential adversaries, continue to develop capabilities uh, to challenge us in the homeland with the intent to reduce our decision space, to delay and disrupt our forward power projection, uh, to destroy our will to intervene in a crisis that may be regional in nature, but that they understand after watching us now for the last uh, three decades that if we're allowed to project force from our homeland, that it's not going to go well for them. We're going to open up that can of you know what on them uh, once that force gets in place. So they're uh, developing those capabilities to disrupt us. I would tell you that we're under attack every single day in the cyber domain and in the information space, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. My biggest challenge is domain awareness. You certainly can't deter and can't defeat something if you can't detect it. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that uh, and how we're getting after that as well. But uh, the challenges with domain awareness are eroding strategic stability each and every day. Uh, strategic stability is really important today. Uh, being able to understand what potential adversaries are doing that enables us to provide continuity of operations, continuity of government, to posture our nuclear forces, those kinds of things, and those are being challenged each and every day. Uh, I would also tell you that I feel like at times that uh, United States Northern Command is a bit of the Achilles heel for our forward power projection in the time that it takes me to set uh, the homeland for defense is uh, outside of the timeline that my fellow combatant commanders may require based on the threats in their AOR to project uh, a power that they need to respond to. And so I think it's my job to, to get inside that uh, timeline so that I am not the Achilles heel and the President's not asking me or the Secretary of Defense is not asking me, when can you get the homeland ready? The homeland needs to be ready each and every day. We shouldn't have to be asking ourselves to get forces ready in time of crisis. We must be ready each and every day. Uh, I would tell you that uh, the PRC and uh, Russia are challenging international norms, laws, rules that have existed since the end of World War II and have kept us safe and sound. Uh, and, and that you see playing out today in the Ukraine, and you see it playing out with China with their Belt and Road Initiative. And the final thing I'd tell you is that the environmental change will continue uh, to challenge us. It's not gonna go away. It's creating opportunities and it's creating vulnerabilities. The question is, what are we gonna do about each of those? And are we gonna take advantage of the opportunities and reduce the vulnerabilities? And I, I look forward to some more questions. So how do we get after it at uh, NORAD and the United States Northern Command? It starts out with policy first. What must you defend and from what? Believe it or not, 26 months ago when I got in the seat, we didn't have policy on what to defend. Uh, it shouldn't be a guy in a uniform figuring that out for our nation. That should be policymakers that, that make those decisions. So I'm proud to report we actually have policy, defense policy, but now we need to have a broader whole of nation discussion about what it is we must defend, those things that might bring us to our, our knees in a time of crisis. But we don't need to defend everything. It's not a patriot and a thad on every street corner and fighters all over the place. It's a small number of things that make it very challenging for any strategic competitor or adversary to be able to slow us down, bring us to our knees in a time of crisis or conflict. So that vision translated into uh, a strategy, merging two strategies, a NORAD and a United States Northern Command into a single strategy that focused on integrated deterrence. Now I'm talking in 2020, December of 2020, before the current administration was in their seat, by the way, that we were focused on integrated deterrence and campaigning. We've created a Homeland Defense Campaign Plan and now a campaign order. And I'm happy to report that campaign order. Now we're out about two to three years 
uh, out in front so we can be inside the gift map process, the global force management allocation process to get access to forces, and also inside the intelligence communities need to be able to uh, give us measures of effectiveness and measures of performance, and I think that's really important. But it doesn't start in the homeland, by the way. My defense strategy starts forward through that integrated deterrence and what I would call layered defense. And defense starts with our allies and partners forward, and my fellow combatant commanders generating effects so that I don't have to generate effects here in the homeland. Those effects can be generated uh, forward. Whether those effects be uh, defeat effects or deter effects, I believe it's the same, and that's how we need to uh, uh, take a look at this and focused on campaigning uh, each and every day. And, and people ask sometimes, well, why do you campaign in the homeland? Well, you campaign in the homeland to, to, uh, to demonstrate your readiness, your capability, and most importantly, your resilience, your resiliency, so that anybody that ever thinks that they could be successful with an attack on our homeland or even an attack forward questions in their gray matter their ability to be successful. Uh, I think that's really important, and that is, serves on a foundation of the information environment. Uh, deterrence relies and is focused primarily on the information space. That can happen through covert, clandestine, or overt activities, and uh, that's really important for us. I think the NDS has got it right. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of the NDS when it focuses on integrated deterrence, and I think the NDS is right that uh, the PRC is the uh, pacing challenge with us. But I fought really hard to get uh, the, the Russians in there, candidly. This was before their acts of February 24th. They are a now threat to the homeland. They are the primary military threat to the homeland today when it comes to kinetic capabilities and also non-kinetic. I, I like to say that the PRC is about seven to 10 years behind Russia when it comes to threats uh, to the homeland. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I am uh, the only combatant commander with a geographic area of responsibility without threshold forces. Threshold forces are what's determined by the Secretary of Defense that you won't go below. Uh, we need to be ready to fight in and from our homeland. And the way I get my forces is through an RFF with just in time, request for forces just in time to meet that need. Those are things that we need to change uh, as we go forward and we're working on changing. Uh, we need to look at our infrastructure. We work closely with uh, Administrator Chriswell, who you're going to get to hear from uh, here a little bit later about our resiliency, our, our ability and our reliance on our, our partners out there, whether it be in municipalities, states, um, industry, et cetera, to make ourselves more resilient. And finally, I think we need to look at uh, some reforms. I told you three to five minutes wasn't going to work, by the way. <laughs> so we need, need to look at some reforms in the department. I hope you give me the opportunity to talk about some of these, Bob. Uh, but we need to approach uh, the threat today from uh, a global perspective. The days of a single supported combatant commander for a regional fight are over. Okay, we're going to have multiple supported combatant commanders simultaneously, and we need, just need to move on past that uh, and approach it from a global and an all domain perspective. And we need to uh, basically move past legacy processes designed uh, to field ships, tanks, planes, those kinds of things into a digital environment where we're moving at the speed of relevance uh, in today's environment inside the department. So I look forward to your questions and see what you have to say. Hopefully you got uh, questions teed up with that. Yes, sir. Well, sir, thank you for those, for those opening remarks. And one of the things you mentioned is that the, the threats to the homeland are real. And I think for our audience today, uh, they'd be very interested in that because frankly, a, a lot of leadership over the past couple generations haven't really made that remark before, but things are changing in the homeland and the threats are real. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and then convey what challenges those threats pose to homeland defense to include that decision space that's being taken away from senior leaders. Sure, Bob, uh, that's a great question. So, you know, some people like to say the homeland's no more, uh, not a sanctuary anymore. I, I think that's pretty cliche. I don't, I don't say that very often, but I will talk about the threats to the homeland. Uh, you know, a little over 30 years ago, shock and awe was truly shock and awe uh, to our potential adversaries and competitors as they watched how we projected power uh, in Desert Storm. And they took note, allowed to build up power over time. Uh, and the use of technology, the use of stealth uh, that, that uh, opened their eyes. And so during that uh, time, while we were focused on violent extremists for the last 20 plus uh, years, uh, they were developing capabilities to hold our homeland at risk, and they being primarily uh, the People's Republic of China, but as I said, the primary military threat to the homeland of Russia. Let's, uh, let's talk uh, kinetically first. And so um, 
about three to four years ago, Russia fielded the first hypersonic glide vehicle sitting on top of an ICBM that's nuclear capable. It's been out there for, you know, four years, uh, operational uh, with the uh, United States of America and North America in, in its sights. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, the, some have said that the uh, fractional orbital bombardment uh, was one of those uh, significant moments. Uh, I would say that uh, actually Russia fielded those capabilities well before uh, the Chinese did. That's just one of them. There are cruise missiles they've developed that can be employed from land, air, uh, subsea, sea, uh, are very low radar cross-section now. Uh, they make our north warning system look like a picket fence. It was designed for a 36,000-foot uh, bomber uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s time frame. And now they can uh, know where all those radars are and uh, circumnavigate those long-range cruise missiles, by the way. They can take off over Russian uh, air bases today uh, and launch their cruise missiles from over Russia and attack uh, almost all of North America, including the United States of America. Uh, their submarines they're fielding. Um, right now, they're on track to field nine SAV-class submarines. Uh, what has been an episodic uh, threat to the homeland, typically in the fall and through the winter time frame, will become a persistent proximate threat. Uh, they just moved uh, SAVs into the, uh, uh, their first SAV into the Pacific. They've got a SAV in the Mediterranean right now and another that's out on its way into the Atlantic. Uh, that will be a persistent proximate threat capable of carrying a significant number of land attack cruise missiles uh, that can threaten our homeland uh, t today. Uh, China's not far behind, like I said, about seven to ten years. Both China and Russia uh, in the space and cyber domain are peer competitors uh, for the most part, and they develop those capabilities to delay and disrupt our power projection and destroy our will uh, in the homeland. Uh, so that's how I lo look at that. Let, let me expand a little bit more and talk to you about uh, uh, the Arctic and what, uh, what's going on is there as well. So as environmental change happens, both Russia and China are significantly interested in the Arctic. It's the closest route to the homeland, by the way, if you're going to attack the homeland uh, the, the, over, over the pole and, and from the Arctic. Russia's already modernized their Arctic uh, infrastructure, by the way, and they've modernized their nuclear forces. More than a dozen uh, installations or so across the Arctic with the intent to change uh, norms and rules that have existed since the end of World War II, as I said, demanding things like putting military personnel on commercial vessels that sail through the Arctic and controlling who, who actually uses what today is uh, routine commerce sailing through the, the uh, uh, northern passage up there and, and ensuring commerce flows uh, back and forth. Uh, th that's what they're doing. Uh, China's not far behind. They they're continue to uh, do surveillance in the Arctic. Uh, under the guise of uh, research and development. W what we know is uh, that's also military development as well. And we look forward as uh, China builds their Type 95 and Type 96 submarines uh, that they're going to field uh, ballistic missile capabilities and park them in the or Arctic just off the Alaska coast, which significantly reduces our decision space and timeline. You ask me, what, why does this matter? Well, it matters because it erodes strategic stability. Or it uh, risks the uh, strategic uh, deterrence failure. You know, if you can't detect a threat, I can't provide continuity of government warning. I can't provide uh, warning to our nuclear force posture. So you have to start making some assumptions. And those are significant uh, threats also as well. I want to talk about one final threat, and that's transnational criminal organizations uh, that are global in nature, uh, that in many cases are more powerful than some state uh, military capabilities. Uh, and they're right there on our, uh, just south of our border in the Western Hemisphere. And now, I don't go after the symptoms of those. That's Homeland Security. What I'm concerned about is the problem that they create, which is instability right here in our own hemisphere that allows access potentially for nations as, such as Russia, China, violent extremist organizations as well. And so it's crucial that uh, we maintain an eye on those transnational criminal organizations. Sir, thank you. Thanks for, for expanding on those. So, sir, you had mentioned during your opening remarks, you spoke about integrated deterrence and campaigning. And I'd, li I'd like you to, to discuss with us what, what that means to you and what opportunities it opens up. Great. So uh, the Secretary of Defense has got it right with integrated deterrence and, and how he talks about it. Integrated deterrence is the use of all levers uh, of not only our nation, uh, w whether it be the military lever, uh, other agencies in the interagency, but my fellow combatant commanders as well. But just as important, what I think is our asymmetric advantage, Bob, is our allies and partners. As we campaign together, demonstrating each and every day our readiness, 
our capability and our resilience. So that's what we're focused on at uh, NORAD and United States Northern Command through our campaign plan, which is crucial. And it doesn't start here in the homeland. This is global campaigning. Uh, that, that w what I would say is, I mentioned it earlier, is you know the regional construct of campaigning is over. China and Russia and others are global problems, and we need to look at campaigning from a global perspective and global objectives and global resourcing and how we're going to get after these problems. And we need to look at campaigning more uh, longer term. Uh, I, ta I told you we're out two to three years. Uh, the department, I think, um, we're, we're a little bit uh, inside of that, and we need to expand our lookout with a, what I would say is a global framework for campaigning based on Secretary of Defense uh, priorities, Secretary of Defense resource decisions, Secretary of Defense risk, global risk decisions. Uh, today we look at things in, in a regional perspective. I think it creates great opportunities. The things I need the department to help me with uh, is working with the interagency on campaigning. For me, campaigning in the homeland is really, really important to demonstrate that resiliency and the readiness. I think everything that we do, whether it be under service authorities while you're building readiness, or whether it be responding to a hurricane or allies welcome, if messaged properly, has a deterrent value. No other nation on the planet can do what we do when it comes to hurricane response, when it comes to uh, the things that you saw with COVID response or allies and welcome as well. Yes, sir, thank you. I appreciate that you brought out the importance of the interagency and in, in, in trying to synchronize that through unity of effort as we work forward. So you also mentioned layered defense, and I was wondering if you could give us your vision on, on what that looks like, and then more importantly, what capabilities you see as being required to execute layered defense. Yeah, absolutely, Bob. So layered defense, to me, uh, as I said, my strategy starts forward, not in the homeland. If we're shooting down cruise missiles over Washington, D.C. or Ottawa, I, I think I've failed. And so what I want to do is partner with my fellow combat commanders and allies and partners uh, to generate effects forward. You know, I have the, the smallest targeting shop of the combat commanders, and people would say, well, why do you need a targeting shop? What are you going to target in the homeland? Well, I'm, I, I'm not targeting anything in the homeland. I'm generating effects forward through other combatant commanders to pre produce targets to get on their target list so that they can service those targets, whether non-kinetically or kinetically, before they become threats to the homeland. So to me, that's what layered defense is really about. It's defense in depth, about generating those effects before they're threats. Now, how do you do that? Well, I think you need to f have a single pane of glass where you can collaborate in real time across all domains to give you a picture. So can you imagine if you could sit down at a single pane of glass and have all the J2s across the combatant commands with allies and partners being able to collaborate on a global picture across all domains to give you a global assessment of what's ongoing. And then simultaneously, the J3s, the operators, are doing the development of deterrence or potentially defeat options in the si same uh, single pane of glass while your J4s, your logistics and uh, your engineers folks are validating whether those are uh, operationally feasible. Is the fuel in the right place? Are the planes, the ships, everything ready? Uh, the weapons, uh, everything loaded? Are the air crews ready? Folks, you don't have to imagine that. We demonstrated it now four times and that capability exists. And so to do layer defense and integrated deterrence, you have to have tools to collaborate in real time to be able to develop that from a global picture. Here's how it works today. Okay, if we have a challenge, it'll be approached from a regional perspective and a regional combat commander will develop options and an assessment. Those options will be looked at through a lens of a regional perspective and they'll be brought into the Pentagon where the first time you actually collaborate globally is at the four-star level with the chairman, potentially even the SECDEF. What I just told you was AOs at the lowest level being able to collaborate in real time and develop in a picture. What do I need? I need the services to help us think like that. The services are focused on sensor to shooter. I'm focused on sensor to decision maker, enabling deterrence to be able to create those decisions that we just talked about. So those are some of the capabilities that we need, as well as sensor to shooter. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't need sensor to shooter, but we also need the sensor to decision maker. And sir, I, I think you just actually uh, spoke about this a bit at the end of, end of those comments, but as a department, you know, you've mentioned we need to, with some urgency, change culture, change process. Would you like to elaborate on that at all? Sure, Bob. <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> well, I, I told you that uh, you know, our processes for acquiring capabilities 
is built on what I would say is an industrial age process. Development planes, tanks, ships, those kinds of things. And we're in a digital environment. You know, the capabilities we've developed, uh, we change the software on them every 14 days. Yet when I presented something like that to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, um, what I got back from the staff, not her, uh, she's on board now, was, hey, come back next year with an issue paper. I'm like, that, that's two to three years in the future. We've got to adapt our cultures to field capabilities like that single pane of glass that I just talked about much sooner. Uh, I talked to you a little bit about the, uh, the, the regional perspective. Our global force management process is in one silo. Uh, our joint exercise process is in another silo and theater security cooperation is in another one. All of those have effects on integrated deterrence. When you um, exercise your theater security cooperation with allies and partners, uh, when you exercise amongst ourselves as a joint force. By the way, the w joint force, the way it works is it goes through JTIMS, which is a volunteer system. Why wouldn't we look at all of those from an integrated and global perspective to be able to field what we have as a limited joint force to get after the secretary strategy, not a regional strategy, the secretary strategy uh, with the limited joint force that, that we actually have. So uh, th those are just a couple of things that uh, I would tell you, Bob. Yes, sir, thank you. So, sir, given what you've said about the challenges of homeland defense, how can the joint force be better postured to support the, that mission requirement? Yeah, so the first thing I told you was the sensor to decision maker. I think we, we got to be able to go down that path uh, quicker than 2030. Uh, those capabilities exist today, folks. Uh, data and information are strategic assets that we need to take advantage of now. You know, Google, Amazon, others have figured out how to share data and information. What we need to be focusing on is making our data available, not in stovepipes, and being able to receive that data. I think uh, uh, that's one of those. Other things, I told you a little bit about how I get forces through a request for forces. I, I think there's things that we can do as a department, and I'm encouraged where we're going, the Global Force Management Implementation Guidance will give me some additional uh, help with having forces that are uh, available to me in a timely manner. What I told the secretary is one of my biggest challenges with executing my con plans and O plans is access to organize, train, and equip forces in a timely manner to operate through my AOR. More than 50% of my AOR is in the Arctic, yet we're, we're not organized, trained, and equipped to be able to operate in that, Ar in that Arctic environment in a timely manner. Those are things that we have to look for, and I'm encouraged where the Army's going. Uh, as I said, the White House on uh, Friday put out their new Arctic strategy, and the number one pillar is defense in the Arctic. So uh, pro probably ought to get after that from a department uh, perspective. Uh, some other things, um, I think since I'm in the, uh, the Army's uh, uh, environment here, uh, you know, one of the things I told you about is the timeline it takes me to set my AOR. Uh, one of those challenges is uh, access to air defense capabilities in a timely manner that have to flow all from Fort Bliss, Texas primarily. Uh, some need to go to Alaska, some may go to the, the, the Washington, D.C. Maybe we need to look differently at how we posture those. And I'm not saying you need a base everywhere, but you can certainly have pre-surveyed and built uh, locations with fiber connected and uh, assets there that we can campaign with and you can move them out in a timely manner and demonstrate readiness, uh, those kinds of things. So that, that's something we need to look at. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little fiction for you. I, I think the future looks vastly different than today. Uh, wh when I come in with my RFF, uh, we have to adjudicate in real time the need for my forces against Indo-PACOMs or against UCOM because they're not planned for on a day-to-day day -day -day basis. Same thing for STRATCOMs forces. So uh, that adds uh, risk in the time of crisis. I, I think we need forces that look vastly different than what we have today, that reduce the demand for tankers, that reduce the demand for fighters. And what I'm talking about is autonomous and unmanned systems. Think about uh, vessels that you can park off the coast against uh, some of those threats that I talked about that policy gives you. And those vessels have uh, domain awareness capabilities that can see potentially even over the horizon. And they also have kinetic capabilities such as SM3, SM6, but more importantly, they have non-kinetic effectors, uh, denial and deception. Think of uh, PNT uh, denial and, and deception or high power microwave or laser capabilities. 
now I'm not asking for all the fighters that are competing directly with Admiral Aquilino or General Cavoli and UCOM, and I don't need all the tankers for that if we position those in key locations uh, around the country. The same thing can be said for autonomous air platforms that give me domain awareness that can loiter for uh, 18, 24 hours and beyond uh, that, that provide uh, domain awareness, but they also provide potentially uh, that kinetic effect or non-kinetic effect. So, so what I may be talking about here is uh, fiction to some. I'm telling you it's not fiction. It's probably within a decade, and those are things that we need to be thinking about. Yes, sir. I, the audience here, they've been circulating among all the vendors here at AUSA, and there's a lot of autonomous uh, ground capability and air capability on display here. It's pretty amazing. So to your point, uh, it's not science fiction anymore. It's just science. So this is the, uh, the last question I have for you, and it's, uh, it, it has to do, with again, with the homeland. You said it's almost a c cliche now, no longer being a sanctuary, but uh, what do you see as the implications of that uh, new reality? And in particular, what are we seeing in the cyber and information domains? Yeah, gr great question. So first, uh, it, it's really a reduction in decision space. You know, the days of being able to project power from a homeland that is uh, uncontested at our own timeline, place of choosing wherever we want to go, uh, they're pretty much over. And the risk of that is that decision space erodes for our nation's most senior leaders, as you alluded to. Uh, so, so that's crucial. Um, so those are kinetic threats. The thing that concerns me most when I talk about domain awareness, and domain awareness is from undersea to on orbit and including cyberspace, is our uh, domain awareness challenges in cyberspace, candidly. And, you know, the power, the, the uh, projection of forces from the homeland, about 80 to 85 percent comes out of the homeland to forward uh, power projection. So whether it be Indo-PACOM or whether it be UCOM, you got to be able to get that force out of the homeland in a timely manner. And as uh, the administrator would tell you, that we are heavily reliant on uh, outside of DOD and federal uh, sources, if you will, for that power projection. Uh, a vast majority of it comes from local municipalities, states, industry, and others that uh, provide C2 for me to defend our homeland. We have to be, as I told you, be able to fight in and from our homeland. Uh, and I worry about the unknown. I don't know the vulnerabilities in cyberspace, candidly, and that's something we have to look at. Now, who's responsible for that? I'd ask you. I'll answer that question for you. It's not General Nakasone. He's responsible for the Doden. It's not Jen Easterly at CISA. She's responsible for other federal networks. Outside of that, it's play if you want or can, okay? And so we don't know what we don't know for those companies, those municipalities, how secure they are in the cyber uh, domain, and that is a uh, concern for me. In the information space, real quick, and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, we're under attack, folks, if you haven't figured that out. What you see in social media, what you see fanned uh, the flames of internal discord, whether it be politics or not, and I'm not going to go into that, but our competitors are fanning the flames of our internal strife and discord to make sure that we are fighting amongst ourselves. They are trying to undermine and erode our democracy on a daily basis. And don't kid yourself that that's not happening. We just need to understand that. And we're at war every day in the information space in the cyber domain. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. Yes, sir. Well, sir, thank you for being with us today. And at, uh, on behalf of General Evans and, and Army North, we're, we're very proud to be the Army component for NORTHCOM under your leadership. And I don't know if the audience knows that in your spare time, you supported the resettlement of over 70,000 Afghan refugees. And that mission was just completed on uh, September 30th, the, the homeland portion DOD portion of that mission, and, and sir, it's a pleasure to work for you, and thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. I'd like to ask our uh, panel members to come on up and take your seats. And
If you could get the doors in the back, gentlemen, thank you. All right, well, it was great to hear from General Van Herk today as he really set the table for us. And many of the things he talked about today was how, how we can prevent or stop an attack on the homeland, uh, which, of course, would be the first thing that we'd want to do. And another large part of homeland defense, of course, is consequence management, and that is if there is a cyber attack that gets through and has an effect on the homeland or anything else, vandalism, whatever it may be, there's a whole consequence management side to that as well. And so our panel here today is prepared to discuss all those things, homeland defense itself, consequence management, how the interagency works together. And I would encourage all of you, please, to think of some questions, because they told me earlier Unless we get 10 questions from the audience today, they won't leave. And I just asked the guys, they've locked the doors in the back. Uh, so I'll ask the first, the first couple questions, and then, uh, and then we'll move to the audience, because I think it's really important to address uh, what you would like. So initially, I'm going to introduce all four panel members, and then I'll go to each one uh, for some short opening remarks, and then we'll go right to the questions. So first, I'd like to introduce Deanne Criswell. She is the FEMA uh, director. Uh, for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, right now, even though we have Hurricane Ian going down in Florida, she still took a few minutes out of her, out of her time. You've probably seen her on television recently with all of that, and thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, so just a little bit about her. She's the 12th administrator for FEMA. She's also the first woman to be the administrator for FEMA. She has 30 years of government service, ranging all the way from local uh, to her last job where she was the commissioner of the New York City Emergency Management Department from 2019 to 21, which was during the COVID response. So incredible experience there. Uh, two years of, of experience in industry as well. So for all of our Indus professionals, industry professionals that are with us, that's very important. Uh, and what I think is the best thing is 21 years in the Colorado Air National Guard as a firefighter to include two deployments to Kuwait and Cutter. Hoo All right. So we also have Lieutenant General John Evans, who's, who's my boss, the Commanding General of, of U.S. Army North, 5th Army. He just came, a, well, a year and a quarter ago from being the Commanding General of U.S. Army Cadet Command. He's got the full range of operational experience, has commanded at every level, to include the Deputy Commanding General of the 2nd Infantry Division, but also the regimental commander of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, Airborne, the Night Stalkers. Uh, and he's a 1988 graduate of Appalachian State University, and I know that he'd like me to point out that they did beat Texas A&M this year in football. <laughs> so we have Ms. Heather King, who is the, uh, the DASD for Homeland Defense and DISCA. Uh, we mentioned earlier about resettling 70,000 Afghan refugees. I bet you're sleeping better at night now that September 30th has come, and, uh, and we've had that done because she has been our, uh, our DOD lead for that, and uh, we really appreciate the working relationship that we have with her. But she served on the National Security Council for two different administrations in multiple positions, advisory roles also for FEMA and the Customs and Border Patrol Agency, and uh, we're really glad to have you here again this year, Ms. King. Thank you for joining us. And we have Lieutenant General Sassville here as well. He's the 12th Vice Chief of the National Guard Bureau, a U.S. Air Force Academy graduate in 1985 uh, with a bachelor's in international affairs, and like everyone on the stage, multiple other degrees as well. Uh, he had active duty tours in Europe and the Pacific as a pilot, uh, and then his last job, uh, he was the commander of the Continental U.S. NORAD Command Region and 1st Air Force, uh, vital job. Uh, in, in the Air Force and I'm now, of course, a vital job in the National Guard. Th so thank you for joining us. And so what we'll do is I would just ask us, we'll just go. We'll just go right from, uh, from uh, left to right on the stage as you're looking at the stage and start with, uh, with Ms. Deanne Criswell. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. It's, it's really great to be here today. And, you know, I enjoyed hearing General Van Herk talk because it is about partnerships, right? And to have 
both um, civilian and military here in the room to have this conversation about homeland defense and homeland security uh, really strikes the right tone. And especially, I think, as you are talking, and the theme here is building the army of 2030. Uh, it's very timely. Uh, the, the conversation that I have been having across the emergency management enterprise or the homeland security enterprise for that fact is that we cannot continue to um, do our planning and our actions based on the risks of the past. We cannot continue to plan against our historical risk because our threats are emerging, our threats are evolving. So when it comes to FEMA and it comes to the consequence management portion that we have, uh, we are very focused, obviously, on the things that we are seeing as a result of climate change. Uh, it, it's been a very busy couple of weeks for me. I went um, from Puerto Rico after they, first I went to check on the recovery from Hurricane Maria, and then they had Hurricane Fiona. I went to Alaska because Alaska had just gotten um, impacts from Typhoon um, Murdoch, I think it was, in the fishing villages on the western coast of Alaska, and then down to Florida for the impacts from Hurricane uh, Ian. And we're seeing these threats continue to change and evolve, and they're different, right? The, the hurricanes that we're seeing today are producing more rain. They're producing more water. They're flood events. They're water events. They're not just rain, uh, wind events. And as you've seen in the news, there's been a lot of conversation out there about you know, whether or not evacuation orders were given in a timely manner. Um, but because our threats are changing, because our threats are emerging and evolving, we have to be adaptive. We have to adjust the way that we are approaching things, and we cannot base all of our actions on how we responded to things in the past. And Hurricane Ian is a great example of that, and even Hurricane Ida last year, which stayed a Category 4 hurricane for almost four hours over the southern coast of Louisiana, but then killed a dozen or more people in New York City because of the rainfall that continued to go across the United States. I think when I think about um, these emerging threats and these emerging challenges that we're having, what I think about is how we are very siloed or very focused in our hierarchical structures, in our very linear processes, and we have to evolve. We have to now move into more adaptive thinking that makes us more agile so we can keep up with the threats that we are seeing, that the emerging threats that are continuing to evolve or the risks that we're seeing from natural hazards. And when we talk about the partnerships, like in this room, these emerging threats continue to evolve. They continue to evolve to the point where we have now stood up at FEMA, an emerging threats office. So while we're focused on the consequences of natural hazards, we're also very focused on the consequences of man-made disasters and the partnership that I've had with General Van Herc and talking about how we can continue to work together to build a structure that can think about the fact that we're going to have limited resources when it comes to these types of threats. When I think about Hurricane Ian and the potential vulnerabilities we have for somebody to come in and create additional adversity through perhaps a cyber attack while we're trying to respond and support the individuals that have just been impacted by this hurricane, we have to be more adaptive. We have to be more agile, and we can't be um, so focused on the linear processes that we're used to, the, the historical risk and the historical ways that we have responded to things in the past. Um, it's been a really great partnership. Uh, at, at my um, journey that I have had throughout my emergency management career, has been one of partnerships, and I talk a lot about partnerships. When I think back to my time in New York City as the Commissioner of Emergency Management, and the partnership that I had with the Department of Defense to come into our hospitals to support and decompress and provide that additional staffing made a world of difference. But it wasn't just the staff, it was the hope that it gave. And I love to share a story, and I wanna share it here too, about during that time, we had well over, I think, 800 um, mil uh, military Title X personnel that came into New York City to support us. And when the last team was leaving uh, one of the hospitals, I believe it might have been Elmhurst, when the last military medical were leaving our last hospital, they had this ceremony to say thank you. And what they said was, 
You were the miracle we needed when we needed it most. Thank you for being our miracle. That level of hope comes from the partnerships that we forge during times like this. Uh, forums like this where we come together and talk about what the needs are going to be and the threats that are changing and evolving and how we're going to be able to continue to support each other as these threats continue to change. I fast forward to Hurricane Ian. We set up the largest search and rescue footprint than we ever have uh, prior to landfall. Um, not wanting to be late to need from a previous NORTHCOM commander. It's something that I think we all have to strive for and we, can, we have to make sure that we are adaptive and agile enough to make sure we can have those forces in there ready to respond and support as needed. Uh, we did need them, we did need some of them unfortunately, but the fact that we were able to bring everybody together ahead of the storm was remarkable and it was our state, it was our local search and rescue teams, it was our FEMA search and rescue teams and it was our Department of Defense search and rescue teams all pre-staged in a way that was gonna be able to respond and immediately as needed. Those are the types of partnerships and relationships that make a difference, and I'm very happy to be part of this conversation today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Joe Evans, sir. Is it on? There we go. Uh, hey, uh, Administrator Criswell, thanks so much for your comments, and really appreciate um, what my boss, General Van Herc, had to say to kind of set the stage here. I will say that the partnership uh, that we have, particularly with FEMA, as probably our most uh, supported uh, lead federal agency is, is incredibly important. And increasingly, as we think about homeland defense and as we think about the concept of what uh, globally integrated deterrence looks like, uh, that partnership is important, but, but also, despite the fact that defense support to civil authorities comes with one bin of authorities and money, uh, and holistic defense kind of comes with another bin of authorities and money and sourcing. They are increasingly growing together. So the, the slide you see that I asked them to project, it should be the only slide we see today, unless Mark brought a slide with him, I don't know. Uh, but, but it really is, it's an, it's a non-scientific slide, so don't, don't go troubleshooting, you know, and, and wargaming my, my uh, critical path there on the bottom. But what, it, what it's supposed to demonstrate is it really, if you, if you start on the left-hand side of that slide, since about 1915, just before our entry into World War I, projected out through about 2035, it shows where we've had peaks and valleys in the relative threat to the homeland. So I'm often asked when people are looking at me, you heard the boss say, uh, hey, we don't say the homeland's not a sanctuary anymore. That's become very cliche. It's become kind of passe, and people tune that out. What, what I'm saying is we've faced some pretty significant times in our history. If you take a look at the big spike there at World War II, if you take a look at the the, the, the plateau that occurred as we were in this mutually assured destruction uh, bipolar world with the Soviets throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. If you look at the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, in 1962, if you take a look at some of these seminal events, and then there's a small blip there for 9-11, right? An attack on the homeland, which was horrible and claimed lives and property and really changed the American psyche in a, in a very significant way. It wasn't, however, existential. And as you see that continued graduation, as we look out through the current time frame here in 2022, out to 2035, and you look at what our adversaries or potential adversaries have done to leverage technology and close our comparative, uh, com comparative advantage gap, that they're, they're working at near parity with us. And they're able to do that because of what General Van Herc said, and that is, we have, over the course of a number of years, for very good reasons and under different leadership throughout our country's last 30 years or so, drawn our forces back into the homeland for very good reason. But now what we see is threats, competitors, potential adversaries, external to the homeland that we know we will have to project combat power to and assure power projection in order to set the stage for decisive combat operations at a time and place of our choosing, which is what our combatant commanders do on a daily basis. So here in NORTHCOM, and as the J flick at uh, United States Army North, I am always thinking about how can I better set the theater for the combatant commander so that when or if Admiral Aquilino asked for forces, or when and if General Cavoli asked for forces, we can, with assurance, project those forces and make sure that they arrive there in time to be able to execute war plans. Because if we cannot deter the enemy from attack, which is our first option, 
we've got to be able to respond decisively. And so as we open the aperture up on this discussion, I want us to think about the fact that an attack in the homeland, a kinetic attack would be on the high end, right? General Van Herc talked about some of the capability that uh, our competitors are developing right now that could hold the homeland at risk below the threshold of nuclear war with kinetic capability. But let's say it's not kinetic. Even if it's in the temporal domain, cyber sp or space, they can still create multiple dilemmas for us in the homeland that we have to respond to. And we'll do that in partnership with our local, state, and federal partners so that we can continue to project combat power forward. That's what our JFLIC is focused on when we're not out assisting our lead federal partners with fires and hurricanes and uh, finding homes for displaced people from Afghanistan and the like. So as you're thinking about the questions uh, for the panel here, think about how you would uh, approach uh, defense of the homeland and setting the conditions uh, so that we can deter our potential adversaries from, from attacking us here because that's what they want to do and that's what they know they have to do because if they let us get forces forward, like the boss said, we can open a can up on them. So thanks, Bob. Thank you, sir. Ms. Heather King. There we go. I think I turned it on. Okay. Um, so just a couple of quick points at the top. As my colleagues noted, you know, obviously the threats and hazards are, are evolving for a myriad of different reasons. One of the things I just want to note, um, and I would be remiss because of my technology background not to note it, but um, that as boundaries are, are no longer defined by geography alone, right, they are uh, often uh, our adversaries are looking at this very differently than we traditionally have vers you know, based on geography. And it is far more based on digital ability to, to um, get into networks and such. So that's the first point I'd like to add related to um, just threats and hazards as a whole. The second point I wanted to touch on is the value of partnerships. I wanted to pick up on something that uh, the administrator noted. Um, my office is responsible for reviewing all of the different requests for assistance that come in across the federal government. Uh, so we take a look at, you know, for a variety of things. Uh, first and foremost, back to what John was saying, authority. What authority is available? What funding is available? Uh, what capability is being asked uh, or requested? Uh, and then we look at the timing in which the request is, is coming in for. When is it needed by? We look at it for a number of things. And in the course of the last year, just to give you a sense of what my office has been responsible for, and I see some familiar faces in the audience because these are teammates that I can I see that I worked very closely, me and my team worked closely with, uh, and several of the folks here on the stage. But we provided support for COVID response, Operation Allies Welcome, Southwest Border, uh, Hurricane Response, Wildfire Response, that's just to name a few. And then my office was responsible, they were the incubator for Operation Warp Speed that many folks heard of, and then supply chain logistics work that was done in response for COVID. Um, that's just an, a, an example of all the different things that my office is responsible for, reviewing those requests for assistance and working across the department internally to determine how best to provide support, work very closely with General Van Herc's team and, and John Evans' team as well, and then partnerships, so that's internally, but partnerships externally. I can't tell you enough how much I'm on the phone with my colleagues at other departments and agencies. Thankfully, I spent 17 years at FEMA, and so uh, that, that experience is always helpful uh, but I can't tell you enough of to the points that have been made before me time is of the essence so when you have an emergency that you can see or you can anticipate being on the phone and anticipate anticipate what's going to be requested what's going to be asked uh, my team always knows that it's a team sport and we're constantly looking around corners to figure out what we think is going to be needed so that we can help uh, those on the ground more so uh, in their time of need and then finally, you know, I think of resilience very much in, in the perspective of the greater prepared we are as a nation, the more resilient we will be. And so uh, I, I think about it in mathematical equations often, uh, you know, the input is preparedness. So the more prepared you are, as I noted, uh, and that means planning, training, exercises, the output is resilience. And so ideally you'll be greater resilient. And, and therefore, when we're demonstrating resiliency to our adversaries, we're being able to project uh, overseas. We're able to uh, provide a variety of different support to our departments and agencies 
uh, then we're demonstrating competence that builds trust uh, amongst us as a team, but then it also demonstrates resilience to any, any given challenge that we might be facing. And then finally, I work very closely with our department, fellow departments and agencies to help them build their own resiliency, right? As I tell my, my son who uh, in a few years will be going to college, I'm not gonna be doing his own laundry uh, when he's in college. I need to teach him how to do his laundry now so that when he gets to college, he can do his own laundry. And so a part of that is helping departments and agencies be more resilient themselves so that they are able to accomplish their missions. Uh, I would often say FEMA is the, the closest to us in terms of being the easy button because we often help our help our partners, uh, both both departments or agencies rather, and so working together as a, as a valued part of that partnership, but also helping them uh, to be able to achieve their own mission. So I'm gonna stop there uh, and turn it over to, to you, Bob. Yes, sir, General Sasso, please.
Sir, could you explain to the audience what you mean by RFF? I know the boss, the combatant commander used the term a couple times, but or I can do it real quickly. So it's basically, it's called a request for forces. And so it's when a, when a combatant command is asking for forces in order to execute something. So for example, when Hurricane Ian hit, initially FEMA had teed up a request for aviation. And what we do then at Army North is we ask NORTHCOM for the aviation they ask the joint staff, and then the joint staff will ask the services. But I just wanted to give an explanation. Continue, sir, please. So it's a convoluted process, uh, but it's, it's designed to make sure, uh, as we discussed before, there's money, there's authority to do all the things that you got to do when you don't get in trouble, but it doesn't do that. So if it's a bad day for America, and things are happening in the 54 states, territories, and districts, and the governors, Thank you. I do, I do want to just make do one shout out for the Army. You talked about the request for forces and how convoluted it is, but what we can tell you is that every time we get a request for forces and we let the Army know right away ahead of time, usually General Pat Work over in the Army staff, the first thing that the Chief tells General Evans, the Chief of Staff of the Army, is you will get whatever you need. And so that's always good to know, right, when you're the FEMA director, that that's kind of how it works on the Army side. So since we are at AUSA, I thought it'd be good to bring that out. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to go through some questions and I will direct it to a panel member and then the other panel members can jump in if they have something to add. Uh, and I'll, I'll move relatively quickly through these because we do really want to hear from the audience. And for the audience, when you ask your questions, we have a, we have a couple rules, right? So you've all been to panels where an audience member, none, none of you would ever do this, but where an audience, audience member comes to the mic and they like tell a story and you almost think they're on the panel, and then they ask the question. We would like you to just ask the question succinctly, and, uh, and you can elaborate a little bit, but uh, again, we don't want to accidentally hijack the panel. None of you would ever do that. So maybe that's what I'm doing right now, though. So uh, let me ask, go ahead and ask the question. I want to go right to interagency coordination, uh, which is so important when we do our mission. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to start, of course, with, with the director of, of FEMA, who does interagency coordination almost every time you execute a mission. If you could tell us uh, how you go about achieving it, uh, any lessons learned, and then we'll see if any other panel members have anything to add. So Ms. Criswell, please. Thank you. Uh, such an important topic, right? And I, I touched on it very briefly um, in some of my opening comments, but FEMA you know, does not have a lot of resources. Everything that we rely on relies on the interagency, and we do that through a mission assignment process. When you hear about the request for forces, how that happens is we will direct a mission assignment to an interagency partner, 
and that mission assignment then gets vetted and figured out how we can source it. I would say the beauty, just to add on to that conversation a little bit, is that we have several pre-scripted mission assignments that have been pre-approved through the Secretary of Defense, so we can hopefully expedite uh, that process because it is, while it is lengthy and long, it's, it is time consuming and, and sometimes we just don't have that time to wait as we just saw as we were preparing for Hurricane Ian. Um, but the interagency piece is critically important and I think the, the way we do it and the way that we have been continuing to mature it is through our emergency support function leadership group. Uh, we call that SFLAG. And that has, we have 15 emergency support functions that are outlined in the National Response Framework. And each of those uh, ESFs, emergency support functions, has a lead agency and then supporting agencies. This group meets on a monthly basis during blue skies so we can make sure that we are coordinated and we're talking through our plans of how we're going to respond to different events, making sure that we keep the connections and the relationships built. And they are then those people that come together after an event happens, like Hurricane Ian, and we do our 12.30 video teleconference every day during a disaster, and it's those ESF leads that come in and report about their actions. And so the, the relationships that we build during Blue Sky Days with this group of, of individuals is what makes us so successful when we're responding to an event. Where we are working to improve our capability and to mature our processes is how we do that during recovery. We have gotten very good at doing this during response, um, but we have to do better when we're talking about long-term recovery. And then in the National Disaster Recovery Framework, we have recovery support functions. There's only six of those. We've never really operationalized those um, to the level that we need to, and that's something that we are very focused on right now, is how do we now operationalize our recovery efforts in the same way that we have operationalized our response efforts. Comes with some challenges. So on the, on the ESF side and the response side, I talked about how we mission assign them, which means that FEMA also comes with a very large checkbook and we pay for those resources to come in. On the recovery side, it's all under their own authorities, their own budget. And so it's harder to get that level of cooperation when they're having to use existing resources, organic resources and organic funding to make those things happen. Um, but we have to get there. These disasters are becoming more complex. The recoveries are taking longer and they're very complicated. We have to have that same level of partnership and engagement in the recovery process as we do in the response process that we have right now. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, but we have um, a great um, RS flag right now uh, that has really been focused on how do we operationalize what we're doing to support what we know and what we we anticipate are going to be the complex challenges in Florida for Hurricane Ian, and then how are we going to take that to mature this process going forward? Okay. Thank you. Ms. King, do you have something to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add is just um, just to kind of uh, draw this out a little bit. So when a mission assignment is, is uh, sent over, my team actually receives that with the team at NORTHCOM. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of context further, um, I think, Dan, your team does a fantastic job. They will often call over and say, hey, we're going to be sending you all this mission and uh, you know assignment. We want to give you a heads up, and then there will be a dialogue about sort of what the capability, what the ask is, and then we're working with Northcom and oftentimes maybe pulling in joint staff as necessary to work through all of those pieces so that we're really aligned um, with not only FEMA but within DoD as well to work out any sort of you know um, just sort of like further details that need to be worked. In fact, we had one over the weekend that we were we were working. So it works out really well. Partly, I would say kudos to the NORTHCOM team and our North and, and FEMA, your team that's calling over and giving a heads up so we can move on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next question is on critical infrastructure and General Evans, sir, I'd like to address this one to you. And, and the question is, is how, how do you determine critical versus non-critical infrastructure and then once you determine a piece of infrastructure is critical then what happens next uh what do you what do you do to protect it or, or what do you do about it yeah so, so that's a, a great question bob and um you know general van hurt talked about the fact that we finally got policy guidance on what defense critical infrastructure looks like and i can't go into great detail about that because of classification guidelines but it's nice to finally have 
kind of a mark on the wall for some things. Here's what I've learned uh, in my 14 months of command at Army North. Critical infrastructure is in the eye of the beholder. Everybody's got some. So uh, if you were to ask 10 different governors what they think national critical infrastructure is, you get 10 different answers. If you ask the administrator what she thinks it is, you get a different answer. And one of our policymakers might give you a different answer too. Uh, we try to collate all this because, because it's a loosely defined term, frankly. And everybody that's got an equity in things that are critical for the continuity of government and things like that um, has, has their own definition. Here's what I would tell you, and this is what I think is important, is what General Van Herc's trying to get to, it's what the department's trying to get to, is what our interagency partners are trying to get to, is we've really got to, to focus in on the things that we must protect. Because at the end of the day, we are going to have some degree of liability and vulnerability for other things. Uh, and every, you know, every mayor of every town, every governor of every state believes that what they've got in their municipality is critical. And it may be for their ability to keep their power grid up for 8,000 people. It may not be with regards to keeping the power grid up on the East Coast. So it's really a function of what we believe is critical. And then DOD's got a role that is almost exclusively those things that allow us to protect continuity of government, our nuclear enterprise, and projection of combat power. And then we've got other infrastructure that's critical for other functions in the government that really kind of speak to what our basic human needs are and what the American people need. So it's very complex in that regard. With regards to what I think about as, as I'm defending it, uh, I, I try to think about how could I assist should I get MAs from uh, FEMA and should the, the uh, department tell me okay, hey, we've, we've got what we need to take care of department stuff. Now the administration has decided this is also something we've got to protect, and DOD, you've got the, you've got the task to do it, so what, what capability are you going to place against it? Uh, Mark talked about it a little bit. Some of it has to do with uh, having redundancy. Some of it has to do with hard pointing or, or building a better physical uh, you know, resiliency so it can't be physically defeated. Uh, and then some of it has to do with dispersal, right? What is it that we can move, make mobile, make it a harder target with regards to whichever domain is going to be attacked through? So a very complex question. I think we're having the conversation more now. I think we've got to continue to have a conversation. Uh, but critical infrastructure, you can't just say it and everybody understands what it is. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Thanks, Bob. Just to augment what John just said. About uh, six months ago, maybe a year ago, Chief of the National Guard Bureau asked the Adjutant General to coordinate with their state emergency partners to identify the top 10 things that they could see in their states uh, that were most important to them along the 16 areas, right? So there, there are 16 widely accepted sectors, right? And, and those are well defined. So which of those 16 are most important to the states? Uh, I'll give you the top five that are important to the governors. Transportation, energy, government facilities, I think that's kind of like command and control, essentially, water, and IT. Those were the top five. Defense, from the governor's perspective, out of the 16, was like number 13. So this is kind of going back to what I, what I said earlier. If it's a bad day for America and we are stressed, we're fighting a hurricane, we're under cyber attack, and we've got to deploy, you name whatever, BCT has to get out of Matsu, are the RFFs going to come fast enough? Who is going to be around to do the things that we want them to do and, and who won't, right? And so that, that's kind of the scenario that I think we need to to have in mind and to exercise and to think through and to plan a little bit. Uh, we're working on it, we're not there, uh, but I think that's where we're headed. Thank you, sir. Ms. Criswell? Yeah, and so the conversation about what do we want to defend is extremely important, um, but as I reflect on Hurricane Ian, it's also about what am I going to need to restore as quickly as possible after the threat has passed. And so they go hand in hand though, right? And so if we're having these conversations about what we're going to need to restore, it'll also help us understand what we need to defend. And I find it very interesting what the, what the governors had listed as important. 
Um, but just an example from Ian, and the thing that we were the most worried about when the hurricane was approaching landfall is if it took out the port of Tampa. The port of Tampa provides almost the entire fuel supply for Florida and other parts of the southern United States. And so we did a lot of pre-planning on what the cascading impacts would be and the interdependencies would be for that. And even if we moved and expanded all of the fuel capacity into the Port of Orlando, it would not cover what was needed. And so we would need additional resources to come in. And so then we talked about expanding the um, ability to utilize the Colonial Pipeline. Now, if we go back one year, we know that there was a cyber attack on the Colonial Pipeline. And so all of these interdependent conversations about the Port of Tampa, even then if it didn't take a direct hit, which it didn't from the hurricane, we're also now in a very vulnerable spot for our adversaries to then do something to also take away that critical resource, that critical piece of infrastructure that we're gonna have to figure out, is it a cause from the storm? Is it a cause from something else? And provide the mission assignments to help restore the capability as quickly as possible because the cascading impacts across the United States would have been so significant. Okay, thank you. It's, it is, it's great to hear how the national response framework comes together to solve those problems. So we'd like to go out to the, uh, to the audience for any questions. I know several of you, so I will start calling on people uh, if we don't get any, but please. Okay, um, there's a microphone right here, sir, if you'd like to use it. Well, thank you all. This has been uh, phenomenal. My name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan Scott. Uh, PhD candidate at NC State. My research deals with understanding the active duty role in, in supporting uh, during a crisis uh, such as the things that you discussed. So one of the questions that I had then is, do you think we are training the operational and tactical level leaders for the level of complexity that you all have discussed, whether it's you know preparing those leaders to respond to a hurricane while also simultaneously being prepared to deploy a combat aviation brigade. Are we doing it? And really the feedback that we're, that we'd get from that, I'm curious to see what, what feedback loops are you getting to say, yes, we are effective beyond the willingness and professionalism of the soldiers when they show up to support, but really are they prepared in the train that we're doing? And hopefully that question makes sense to you. Okay, great. We'll start with Lieutenant General Evans. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. We, we spend an awful lot of time kind of staring into that problem. I think what you find is, um, as, you, as you take a look at the way that DISCA and Homeland Defense come together, you start to lose, the, the very clear line starts to get blurred very quickly, particularly if you're talking about a national level attack, right? I'm, I'm talking about a near peer adversary decides they're gonna hold our homeland at risk, and they're going to do things to create multiple dilemmas in the homeland, some of which might be attributable, others which may not be. And if they're smart and savvy, they do it at the same time, we've got an Ian rolling up the East Coast, or that we've got something else, wildfires burning out west, so that we've got all of these other dilemmas that we're facing and, and trying to deal with. Our challenge is we teach our war fighters to, to fight war forward, right? So we focus them on combat tasks, and we employ them under Title X authority with very clear and unambiguous rules of engagement. Now let's back up the truck a little bit and consider that we suddenly have to defend, and I'm talking about physically defend, uh, some type of infrastructure or something from threats unknown, whether that's saboteurs, whether it's people who might be um, seditious in nature, or whether it's frankly civil unrest that is rolling towards a major piece of infrastructure. Now you've got Title X forces, a little bit different for the Guard, now you've got Title X forces and you're asking a young man or woman, okay, you need to defend this, We'll defend it with what? With, with lethal force? We don't have the authorities to do that in the homeland for very good reason. So now you start to get into the more complex question of, okay, do we ever extend that authority? And there are ways to do that legally. When do we do that? How do we inform decision makers about how we do that? Getting back to your basic question, I think we train our leaders to handle a multitude of dilemmas uh, very ably. Adding the homeland dynamic to it makes it incredibly complex, so we're probably not there from a training standpoint. And it's not something that the Army is asked to train to. We do it a little bit in the Guard, but the active Army, we don't do it. Joe Sasseville? Just one quick point, since your question is about training, something to add to the conversation. There is a, 
Uh, after Katrina, we learned that when you have a bunch of Title X coming in, 32 already on the scene, maybe, or vice versa, you really need unity of command. And so the team put together a dual status commander course that is a, is a vibrant course. It's taught out at, uh, at uh, headquarters there, Colorado Springs, and, um, and it's a very well uh, established process with approvals all the way up and down. Uh, we got close to using it here recently. Wasn't needed because no Title Ten forces went to Florida, but uh, that would be something that I would point to for leader training. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, ma'am, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to Gil Sanborn after that. Thank you. My name is uh, Barbara Meadows. I work for uh, Deanie Criswell. I'm the uh, um, in response, and I am the uh, uh, the Planning and Exercise Division Regional Branch Chief. So my responsibility is to ensure that deliberate planning specifically is integrated and is going well within the regions. Historically, we've planned without um, having a constrained environment. We have plans so that we know that, that everything is available, whether that's from the interagency, whether that's from DOD. So now we're looking at planning in a constrained environment. So my question is about the National Guard, and oh, by the way, with, with putting it all out there, I'm also in the National Guard. I'm in the Maryland National Guard, and I'm the J-34. Um, so knowing what it means to be Title 10 versus Title 32 versus state active duty, you mentioned something about will a governor be able to retain their folks on state active duty when a Title 10 mission comes down the pipe? Do you see resolution to this, especially since we're talking about this very big problem down at the state level about any type of a response, whether or not the National Guard will be available, whether they're overseas or there's something else going on in the homeland. Do you see this as a policy issue or do you see this as a legislative issue as to whether or not a governor can retain if they're doing a critical mission within the state? So thank you for the question. Um, I see it as both, and it depends to figure out how is this going to play out. Uh, the federal government, so the National Guard, as I mentioned, job number one is fight the nation's wars, right? And, and, and that was the deal that's been in, in, uh, in place for the past 100 years. That's why we're the National Guard, not the Maryland Guard or the Delaware Guard or whatever it is, right? We're the National Guard, and, the, and, and what that gave us, what that gave us the nation was essentially primacy to the federal government that they could be called up to go overseas anytime. So it depends on whether it's a federal emergency or not, fundamentally, right? So I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I would need a uh, secure legal opinion if I really get into this, but fundamentally, <laughs> Uh, if it's a federal emergency, a national emergency, things are going to look very differently than it's, if it's a regional one. But I do think that we need to look closely at that, and I'll turn it over to Ms. King. I don't want to put her on the spot if she's got any uh, thoughts on that, but I do think that uh, the, a, a legislative uh, turn would be required if policy were to be changed. So I think you may see some, th some of that. And, and can it be fixed without policy? I don't think we know the answer to that yet because we haven't really, to your point, stressed the system. We, you, I think you use the word constrained, right? But if, if, if there are tremendous demands on the nation, um, I, I don't know that we've really exercised or planned to that level, that, uh, to the maximum level that we can or should yet. Thank you. So the only thing I would add is my lawyer would, would and he, and we actually talked about this last week, uh, and so it does, it depends. That is literally his answer to me. It depends on the authority, uh, well, it depends on the request specifically, right? And, and so it starts off with exactly what are the perimeters with the request, authority, and then all the way down the line. And so we get questions like this a lot. Um, we have to look at the nature of the request. Um, to General Sasserville's point, right, we, you know, it, we have a global mission. And so all of that is sort of balancing and looking at sort of what is being asked. Is it a capability, so equipment or air transportation, or is it personnel? Uh, and, and it's a constant sort of looking at all of these issues against the authorities. So I've learned, if anything, I need to be a lawyer. So thank you. Depends is becoming a part of my vocabulary on a regular basis. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sanborn. 
Uh, good afternoon, Gil Sanborn. I'm a CASA from Northern California. First, thanks very much for a terrific panel here. Uh, I'm not going to tell a story, but I'm going to put my question into a context. Uh, yesterday, the Secretary of the Army talked about our incredible challenge in recruiting. And part of that is the very small propensity to serve, 9%, which means 91% don't have a propensity to serve. And that's not organic to those young men and women. It has to do with influencers and people who steer people away from service. You are our best asset because you represent our ability to deal with threats that are uh, uh, threats to the homeland. What, what's your strategy in terms of telling that story, in terms of projecting it out uh, in, in uh, collaboration with uh, the rest of our public affairs and, and outreach program? Because w what I see is when people don't think they need an army, that changes immediately when the flames are in the, in the backyard or there's a, a landslide or an earthquake. So how are you integrating your public affairs with the, the fact that the Army needs to tell its story uh, in, into the homeland? Okay. Joe Evans, sir. Yeah, I'll jump on that first, and then Mark might want to jump on it, because uh, the Guard does a fabulous job of this, talking to and recruiting people by talking about how they can help their state and their homeland. So, so I'll leave that to him, but, but I, it is a, a challenge, right? Um, I think a lot of it gets back to what General Van Herc was talking about, about campaigning and about projecting and messaging and controlling our narrative, right? We, we, we tend to lose our narrative right now. Uh, we're struggling a little bit, I think, because the information space is being challenged. Um, some of that's internal strife, but some of it, frankly, is like he said, people with disinformation and misinformation trying to generate and churn that internal strife which takes our young people who are our principal recruiting population and, and you know, makes them think, well, why would I want to be part of that mess right now? Why, why do I want to be part of the government if it looks like things are just not the way they're supposed to be? Uh, now, you know, under the layers of, of what we see uh, on, in the social media threads and other things, it's a pretty solid group of folks still, very patriotic, great culture, still doing the right things for America. How do we get that message out there? And I think it's all about what, what General Van Herc said. Every opportunity we have, we should campaign. We're campaigning to make sure our adversaries or potential adversaries know that they should not contest, try to contest us in our homeland. We need to make sure that the American people see that we are taking a strong stance to protect the homeland and that it's worth investing their son and daughters in to be able to carry that forward. And it's all about our culture. Just a couple thoughts, um, and we were talking about this uh, in the van on the way over here. First of all, the guard situation is unique, obviously, because we're community-based, right? We're in all 54, and, and so the, the challenges are, frankly, quite different, right? The, the networks are there. There's no rotation every two, three years you PCS out and, and go do something different. So uh, our, our recruiting, we have challenges in the guard, right, 98% uh, this year. Uh, and and the forecast isn't too rosy either for a whole bunch of different reasons, but it is a little bit different between the compos. I, uh, I'm not a recruiter, I won't speak for the recruiters. My sense is we might not be hitting the right targets, right? So if, if you're uh, taking marketing to uh, a movie theater audience, you're not probably hitting the people that you want to be hitting because they're not going to the movies anymore, right? They're on, on these things. A, a significant amount of the time on different types of social media, and that's where you're going to make the connection, I think. So uh, I understand, I'm not sure, but I think the Army's got a program to really boil all this down and say, where are we actually making contact with, with, the, with youth for today? And then, and then finally, I, I think there's a sense that we don't maybe, we're not under threat anymore. There's no evidence of that. I think the, the, now that we're out of Iraq, uh, people are thinking, okay, well, you know, show's over, nothing to see here, we can go on. Uh, and all we're really left with is trying to describe it verbally of what a hypersonic missile is, what a cruise missile is. And that's really tough to do. So I, I was uh, thumbing through Twitter last night, yesterday, and so I, for the first time I've seen a, cru a Russian cruise missile flying in, I don't know if anybody else saw this, it does its fly-up maneuver, tucks over, and impacts the ground, impacts 
Kiev. That little clip is exactly what we ought to be showing the kids and saying, here's what the threat looks like. Here's what we're talking about when we're the, the next generation of, of Putin's six new threat systems that he's building. This is one of them. This is what that's. So, so maybe uh, that's actually helping us if we can capture some of that footage and, and put that in a real context for uh, America's youth. Can I, I just want to add one thing to that. It, what I find is that it's not just here, right? It's public service in general. Um, I just came from this morning a round table with different associations with the fire service. Same question. We're having trouble recruiting firefighters. When I became a firefighter, it was very competitive and it was hard to get there. And now they can't even get enough people to apply for these different types of positions. I think that to what, to what the panel has said, our approach has to be so different because we have to somehow reinstill the sense of duty and that sense of desire to want to be a public servant and what it means to be able to give back to your country in whatever way, whether it's in the armed services, the firefighting, emergency management, and we're just losing that. And so I think we just have to have a whole different conversation about how do we reach people to help them understand the value of public service and, and what it can do for them in their career long term. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Gil. It sounds like the theme for next year's AUSA should be where hiring, right? Yeah. So, okay, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name's John Conger. I'm the former DOD Deputy Comptroller and I was uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment. My, my question is on the demand signal uh, for forces when you're responding to a disaster. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the readiness impacts that are on uh, across the board on forces as they uh, respond to these demands to natural disasters to other homeland defense missions but but in addition to that, can you speak to the the degree to which that demand is going to start to impact uh, force structure decisions you know are, are we actually going to to act, uh, to uh, size the force to accommodate these kinds of missions as they grow into the future? I'll take that one to start with, and a little bit to unpack there. I'll answer your first, your last question first, and that is no. So we're going to build a a military force to fight and win our nation's wars. That that's what we do. The first question you ask is a really good one. It's one we struggle with all the time, and I'm looking at Heather here because this is what we we go back and forth on. Uh, you know. The administrator is kind of, you know, at the regional level, her, her regional administrators are taking a look at the hard requirements and going, okay, yeah, we think this is probably in DOD's lane. Then they kick it up to national, and national looks at it and goes, yeah, we need to go to the department. And the department looks at it and goes, okay, you know, hey, the cost is high here, you know, because there's going to be readiness impacts, there's going to be training impacts. And so they are very, very diligent about saying this is something that only DOD can do, force of last, you know, uh, force of last choice. Uh, and we saw this with Operation Allies Welcome, which is probably our most recent pain, right? Pretty significant undertaking, but frankly, nobody else had the capacity or the scale to be able to do it based on the immediacy of the mission and how critical it was to our national interest. So uh, the, the services swallowed hard, they came to the table, but what they did is they went back to the secretary and they said, here's the cost. Here's what you don't get if we put men and women at uh, Quantico or JBMDL for the next three, four, five months taking care of this problem set. They're not out there training. They're not, they're not building readiness. We are backing up people who are on deployment timelines. We are having to double down. We're having to assume risk, which is really what it's all about in the end state is how much risk are we willing to assume? So I don't know and I, and I don't think we'll ever find uh, the ability to build capacity just to do that. I think we leverage uh, our Compo 2 and 3 partners pretty well in that space. Uh, but when you start talking about bringing Title 10 forces in, there's a significant cost. And, and I'm sure Heather will talk about how the, the, the department goes through that, that mental gymnastics. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it is a, that is a very good way of describing it, mental gymnastics. Um, so I think Operation Allies Welcome is a really good example of that that was cited. Um, you know, we, we absolutely looked at, you know, we were essentially told within less than two weeks time we needed to prepare and, it, and the numbers kept going. Those in the audience that were working on this mission recall, we prepared for 6,500. 
and before long it was 50,000 more and that was that was in less than two weeks time period that we needed to have it ready have the the eight installations ready uh, and it was really through John Evans and, and the work that you and your team did and others did um, within the guard and with uh, joint staff and others but um, I would say in terms of readiness, you know, one thing I've learned is in my conversations with the interagency, I'm constantly having to explain what do we mean by readiness. Folks on the outside of DOD, they don't know really what that means. And so a lot of times in my conversations, whether it's with joint staff or with Army or whomever, I'm really asking, I'm pushing because I'm saying, okay, what do, we, what do you really mean? What is that, you know, are you talking about a battalion or a, some unit that is, that is mission that we absolutely need to be able to move forward with if we, if we get caught into a particular conflict? What does that mean for that unit or that battalion or what have you? And so I'm constantly pressing and part of why I'm pressing internally is so that I can go and explain it in layman's terms to folks that don't, leave, don't live in, by DOD lingo. And, and it's helpful, right, because I spent most of my life outside of DOD. So I'm constantly translating between DOD uh, folks and then outwardly to whether it's the White House or with other departments and agencies. I really see my role as, as a big translator. Um, the more that we can make it real and, and make it, um, you know, a lot of times I'll explain it as, look, this is the real impact um, that you're, you're asking for this capability or you at, you're asking for this duration. Here's what we mean by the real impact. And I, I put it very, very, um, I had a conversation recently with an interagency partner and I said, look, our folks don't train for that mission that you're asking for. And here's what you're explicitly asking and the impacts. And when I did it like that, they were like, oh, okay, I'm, 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 I'm not gonna ask again, okay. So that's a lot of translation. Um, I will tell you the secretary and the deputy secretary take that very candidly, uh, the readiness impacts. That is part of the conversations. It's part of the memo. Whenever we tee up a decision for review and consideration, we are including that uh, because we want to make sure they're armed with all of the facts, right? Part of my job is making sure, working with our partners, that we are arming decision makers with the facts. So. And if I could just add a little bit on that, and I think taking it from a different lens from my perspective, I look just look back to COVID-19 and we had a nationwide response. And so when we're talking about uh, threats to the homeland, there is an example of a nationwide response that we really relied on one specific component of the Department of Defense, and that was medical personnel. Um, but a large number of that came from the reserve forces. And so while we talk about readiness of the armed services, we also have to think about the um, deconflicting where we're getting our resources from. So in that example, we were pulling medical personnel in through the Department of Defense to support the operations, but we're pulling them through the reserves from the local hospitals that they're working in, and we create this conflict of resources. And so having those conversations about what the risk is isn't just about the readiness of the forces, but where are we getting them from? I think about you know, other times where it's, uh, we will mission assign the Department of Defense to do something, um, but it's a contract that they're going to use to execute that. Uh, I think a lot about DLA and fuel, but those are the same contracts that our local providers are using, and so we actually can create more problems sometimes if we're not thinking through the unintended consequences and the interdependencies mm -hmm. of how we're sourcing the requirements. My two cents. So, uh, Administrator, great, great example on on the uh, reservists that went up into New York City and and uh, did God's work up there. That's it. That's exactly the scenario that I'm concerned about on the cyber front, where we pull reservists to defend the dote in probably the hardest target in the world, and then we're leaving uh, cyber capacity or, or or tapping a cyber capacity that's not available out to the critical infrastructure. So, uh, to to your question from a guard perspective on, on the latter piece, super hard to move structure, force structure around from state to state. It's, it's kind of stable there. If you're not talking about increasing in strength or adding to it, you're talking about taking from another state to put into another one, right? So it's a zero sum game, very difficult to do. Uh, small trades on the margins typically, but, but nothing sizable. Um, the states have other options that they are looking at to, to help with a manpower issue, uh, and, and there are some that are concerned about that. So it is a real conversation, uh, but it's a tough conversation to have. On the readiness side, uh, again, to the administrator's point, there are things that 
you can't capture that aren't easily measured in terms of a sorts or a DERS rating on a right on the C or you know YQ uh, scale. The double tapping, the community is one, but the other thing is if you're talking about using a guard unit that's basically in reset, it's okay for them to be down on readiness because that's what's expected. So the danger isn't low readiness ratings there, the danger there is overuse. And we don't have a great way to capture overuse and just wearing guardsmen out. That's what we ask the adjutant general to keep track of. Hey, let us know what's happening in your state. They're there, they're, they're on the ground, they're, they're understanding their guardsmen better than anybody else. How are things going? Can you take more? No, I need a break, I need a pull back. And so uh, that's an intangible, but it's a very real thing and it's not a readiness thing for us uh, most of the time. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so we're gonna take two more questions and then I just want the panelists to think about, it. I'll give you each a chance to make some very short closing comments and, sir? Yes, Mark McCarley, from a general perspective, upon the invocation of the Stafford Act and followed by the stand-up of a joint command post with our North and with FEMA and its EFs, uh, ESFs uh, circling around the campfire, so to speak, what role does the governor of the particular state in which this unforeseen consequence took place retain in the overall command and control of the execution of both response and recovery? I can start with that yes, one. Yes, yeah. <laughs> The governor has, it, it's all about the governor, right? So in order to declare, for the president to declare a disaster, it has to come as a request from the governor. There are certain situations that the president can do it without that request, um, but by and large, the governor has to make the request, I make the recommendation of the president, the president makes that declaration. So that's how the Stafford Act gets um, started and it frees up the funding and the ability to then mission assign our federal partners to come in and support. Uh, the governor also has to cover a cost share, right? And so all of the resources that we mission assign, whether it's the Department of Defense, whether it's interior, whether it's energy, uh, the governor has to cover 25% of those costs. And so the governor needs to sign off on every mission assignment as well, right? So the request, they will send the original request up and they need to know and we brief them, this is what it's gonna cost you. We've often, and we have done this right now for Hurricane Ian, we will cover 100% of those costs for the first 30 days in Ian right now, we're covering that for the first 60 days because our focus is on saving lives. And we don't want that cost to delay the ability to save lives or stabilize that incident because it has so many cascading impacts. But once you get beyond that, or if that hasn't been um, uh, designated because it's not for every disaster, just depends on the, the severity of the event then the governor has to have that request and has to acknowledge that they're gonna cover 25%. And we will let them know how expensive the Department of Defense is and that they have other resources too, right? That they can EMAC, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, much cheaper for them to request other state assets to come in and support. Sometimes that's done through the National Guard as well, but the difference in cost is, but now you're weighing time and cost, right? Because it could take more time um, than it would take perhaps the Department of Defense. So the governor is very involved, or at least his representative in those conversations. Yeah, on the military side, and you heard General Sassville talk about it a few minutes ago, once we invoke a dual status commander, that really becomes kind of the inflection point for the governor and the TAG yeah. to kind of provide their you know, uh, requirements, priorities, and what they want to, to me as the, as the Joint Task Force Commander, so to speak, the JFLIC Commander. We saw this a lot with COVID when we had multiple dual status commanders invoked across many states. And we might even have a dual status commander who's out doing firefighting in California while everything else is going on. And that really becomes the, the, the input point, uh, as it were, so that we can make sure that the priorities that DOD is tackling is number one, the things that we've been put on task to do, which is very important, right? Because the mission assignment is very prescriptive in that regard. And then number two, the things that, uh, that, that are ticking away at that priority list that the governor might have. Appreciate it, thank you. Okay, all right, sir, the last question goes to you. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Lahan. I'm a, an Army officer currently on loan to FEMA. And my question is about General Sassville's uh, sort of bad day for America scenario. 
So you mentioned that there are a lot of unknowns uh, in terms of force availability and, and other sorts of planning factors. And my question is, you know, what are we doing both in terms of the interagency collaboration space uh, and the exercise space to, to try and reduce some of those unknowns and plan against uh, that sort of doomsday scenario that you described? Well, of course, we have the, you know, the standard planning and the standard exercises, and I'll ask uh, Ms. King here to jump in. Uh, that's, that's her domain. I'm not going to stick my nose into that, and the administrator probably has some thoughts on that, too. But, um, but uh, I, I think we're positioned to get at it. We, we need a little, probably a little bit of push and a little bit more uh, fine-tuning of uh, exercise scenarios, uh, willingness to actually go there, right? Because it's that's not an easy thing to get at, right? And you got to be careful of uh, wanting to have the answer if you're gonna if you're gonna put the question out there, right? So um, uh, the, we talked about the authorities piece and, and making sure everybody understands that. And then fundamentally, I'll, and I'll stop here. It would be a very helpful for everybody to be on the same sheet of music when it talks when we when we're talking about definitions, right? So. What is homeland defense? What is not homeland defense? What's homeland security? What's not homeland security? There's still a little bit of um, refining, I think, to be done to make sure that we're not talking past each other inside the interagency, let, let alone inside DOD, frankly. So on the latter point, um, you know, I, I think from a policy view, we, we are doing some internal work that we're going to, to be working on over the next several months with our partners focused on um, clarity of definitions. So Homeland Security versus Homeland Defense, what exactly do we mean so that we can have those conversations too with the interagency over the next several months. So, so more to come, but that work is, is uh, very much starting uh, to make sure that we're very clear about what we mean by these terms and then having conversations with the interagency partners too for on that on that on related to to your exercise point there's a national exercise program when i was housed at fema uh, for a long time that that fema actually uh runs on behalf of of the usg i'm going to turn it actually to to the administrator to talk about it but it is a robust program that's been around for a long time and i'm a huge fan of so I'll turn it back to you Yes, yeah, so we do have the national level exercise program, uh, conduct an exercise every other year. And then in the off years, we do um, more FEMA um, centric exercises. I think what I would say though, and Lieutenant General Evans and I had this conversation at our first meeting, I, we don't exercise to failure enough. We, we script them too much that we all look good at the end of the day, we all win and everything's perfect. And if we can't be willing to actually run these scenarios, these no-win scenarios that truly call out our gaps, then we're not gonna know what we need to fix. And so we have to be brave enough to start having more exercises that truly test our weaknesses and not be afraid of failing, but actually do it to failure so we can improve. And that's the direction that I think that we need to go, and that's one of the conversations we've been having. If I could just add on your point, I, I think it's a really important one. Before I came back into DOD, I was in the technology sector, and I will tell you, there were posters up everywhere that said fail fast and often, right? And it was about, like, don't be afraid to make mistakes, be vulnerable, be humble, and we were constantly pushed to the nth degree. And we had very candid conversations. I worked for the CEO and CEO of that company, and we were working very closely on, I remember going through exercises, scenarios, and they weren't scripted, not a one was scripted. And we were working through it in real time, talking through if such and such event happened, how would we deal with it? I can't encourage you all enough. I think that's a really powerful point. Be vulnerable, actually do away with the talking points and, and don't be afraid to, to you know, make mistakes as you're talking through things. So it's really important. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, 10 minutes left in the panel. I would just, what, it, for each panel member, if, if you have a concluding comment or something you want to leave the audience with, with respect to your agency and Homeland Defense, uh, that would be great. And Ms. Criswell, we'll start with you and go down the line. That'd be great. I, I think just to summarize, it's really kind of where I started. Uh, our threats are evolving, our threats are emerging. There are a lot of interdependencies in the decisions and the resources that we have that are gonna affect our decisions. Um, the cascading impacts are getting more complex with each and every type of man-made or natural disaster that we're facing. 
And we have to, I think, as a federal family, learn how to become more adaptable and not just focus our efforts on the way we've always done them and learn how to do things in parallel fashion, even though our processes are very rigid, they're very linear. Um, I think as you heard Heather talk about how we have conversations ahead of time, working the process so they can get through faster, we have to be that agile. We're never gonna keep up with the complexities that we're facing from natural disasters, from the consequences that we're gonna be facing from our adversaries if we don't learn how to be more adaptable and more agile to approach them. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'd kind of uh, harken back to what General Van Herc said about our national defense strategy. It's, it's a good strategy. Uh, uh, well researched, well written, and on point, and the number one priority in it is homeland defense. Um, you know, last week or the week before last, we were talking in real terms in many circles about what does the use of a tactical nuclear weapon look like and what does that do to the world order? We haven't had that discussion in a long, long time. And sadly, we're at a point where we have to entertain those types of ideas because of things that are going on in the world. And so what I would say is, I'll get back to what uh, both uh, Administrator Criswell and uh, General Sasville said, and frankly, uh, uh, Desti King as well. We've got to have a willingness to have the uncomfortable conversations. Uh, now that is hard in the homeland because it is not politically popular to, to suggest to the American people they may not be safe in their homes or in their country, but we've got to start to open the aperture there and have real discussions about what the risks are here. Because if our enemies can hold us at risk below the threshold of nuclear war to accomplish their means in their part of the world, in their region, I believe they'll do that. So I think that's what we have to be focused on. So all the points before me, spot on. I think that the one thing I have learned the more and more that I work in this space uh, every day is um, every time you think you know it all, check yourself because none of us know everything and constantly, constantly be humble and rely on your teammates, right? Everything is a team sport that we do. And I hearken back to Operation Allies Welcome. It was, you know, working with my teammates, Bob Fenton and several others, um, working day in, day out. It was a very, very challenging mission. It was constantly changing, on, challenging, changing us and challenging ourselves. Um, but one thing it taught me was the persistence uh, resiliency and team team camaraderie. We together across the entire interagency and within DOD, I saw things that I, you know, attributes of teammates that I was completely um, just in, it was inspiring. And then I would just leave you with um, that mission. You know, I was, I visited all the installations constantly. I know you did as well, John Evans. And um, in Quantico, when I was walking around, there were two little girls that came up to hold my hand. They must have been three and four years old. And I'll never forget, they came out of nowhere just to walk around the installation with me and hold my hand. And they, they were looking up and smiling at me as I had like all of these military men around me. Um, and I will tell you, it, it taught, uh, it, it really showed these little girls a, it was gonna, they were going to have a totally different life here in the U.S., and B, one day they can do anything if they work hard enough. And so just I encourage you all constantly be humble and challenge one another. So I talked about war fight. That's job number one, uh, you know, back at home here taking care of the homeland, job number two. And then uh, partnerships is, uh, is the other pillar, I guess, uh, that we talk about in the National Guard. Partnerships. Uh, within the states, between the states, interagency, and uh, and that's not going to change. I, I think that is something that we need to focus on in the future. Uh, you hear in NDS allies and partners, and uh, for the overseas piece, and we got uh, neighbors to the north and and uh, good neighbors to the south. But I'm really just talking about as a nation the partnerships that we need to continue to develop. Be be active in that, be active in developing those, reaching out to people that you didn't reach out to before, uh, because to get through this next decade, two decades in the national security environment that we're in is going to require that. And it's gonna require agility of mind. It's going to require us to do some things differently than we've done before. And we need to embrace that. That's the only, the only constant is the change. Nothing's ever the same. There's always new missions, new ways of doing things. Technology uh, improves that both on the blue and on the red side. 
So, um, so we cannot afford to be entrenched. And I know, again, for the, this is an Army audience, but building the Army of 2030, clearly you all know that change is a big part of that. And, uh, and that applies, I think, also here to defending the homeland. Okay, sir, thank you. So we'd like to thank AUSA for, uh, for hosting the panel today, thank our panelists, and of course, General Van Herc as well, and this great audience. You all uh, were wonderful, appreciated the questions and your attentiveness, so let's just give everyone a round of applause, please. Thank you. And this concludes today's panel.